to show you our introductory video before I take you through what we're going to talk about this morning. Thanks, Elizabeth. I didn't hear anything this oh, week. At all, it was plain. Oh, That's man. fine. I'm sure you'll sort it out, perhaps for next week. Oh, sorry about that. That's fine, that's fine. So welcome to our health hour. As you know, we have a regular Saturday health hour. And so I'm delighted this morning to um, invite a colleague and a friend, Mercy Ochuka Emore. And we're keeping with our theme of having um, senior black health professionals from across the country tell us about um, things about our health. Last week, we had a really interesting session on child um, mental health. And we're going right to the end of the spectrum and looking at dementia in old age. I think it's an important topic because even if you're not old yourself, we're hoping that we get there but you will have relatives, friends, who perhaps can benefit from some of the things we might hear today. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Mercy, who's going to tell, talk to us today about what I think is a, a really interesting topic. So over to you, Mercy, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Ngozi, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me to talk about this topic that is quite important, not just to me, but to the black community as a whole, because we are now an aging population in the UK and dementia is quite common as people get older and the importance of understanding what dementia is, the symptoms to look at for, and our best to manage it cannot be overemphasized. I'm going to be sharing my screen with you, just a minute. Can you see the screen? Can you see my slides? Hello. Yes, sir. Not yet. Okay. All right, just a minute. Is it? Is it? Share the screen. Oh, uh, I need to share. Share, let's share. All right. Okay. Yes, thank you. Can thank you see? You. Yes, we can see it. Thank you very much, Mercy. Okay. All right. Okay, so what is uh, dementia? I work with. Uh, older people's team, mental aid team in Norfolk and Suffolk, uh, mental aid trust as a consultant psychiatrist, OD psychiatrist is my area of expertise. I look after people with dementia from the beginning of their diagnosis to the end of their journey with the illness. And we also cover other mental disorder beside dementia, but mainly in the elderly. But today's uh, topic is primarily on dementia. So I'm sure uh, most of us would know a thing or two about dementia, either within our own family or friends that we know of. It's an illness that usually affects the elderly. It's a disease of the brain and is mainly the memory that's the key uh, symptoms uh, of dementia, memory loss, mainly short-term memory. But as the illness progresses, the long-term memory might also be affected. It can also affect people's language. It can affect the ability to think, to plan, to make a uh, decision and also their personality might be affected. It's usually bad enough to prevent them from looking after themselves properly, to make them struggle with their day-to-day -day job 
and household chores and also their interaction with other people. It's an illness that, that slowly but gradually deteriorates with time. Like I said earlier, it's an illness mainly for the elderly, but there are few people below the age of 65 that can also be affected. We refer to that as early onset dementia, that's dementia occurring in people below the age of 65 years. Most of those tends to run in family, but there are few of them that can be sporadic. The black community in the UK is aging <laughs> and also is the incidence of dementia within the black community. A few studies have been done mainly in London, which has identified that the black community are more likely to develop dementia than the white uh, community within the country. And there's also the tendency for the diagnosis to be made within the black community at a later stage of the illness. And this is primarily because people do not seek help on time. So what are the symptoms? Like I mentioned earlier, the primary symptom is loss of memory, which medically we refer to as uh, amnesia. And that might take the form of people forgetting information they've been told. Sometimes people will swear blind that the conversation did not take place in the first place. They might forget plans that they've made with people. Maybe they've decided to meet up somewhere and they won't show up because they've forgotten the information. They might even be part of an event and cannot remember participating in that event. People might start repeating themselves and often you will hear their loved ones telling them, you've told me that story before. It's because they can remember they said it previously. They might put things away, sometime within their own home. They've kept them in safe places. That could include things like their phone, their wallet, their glasses, hearing aid, and even money. And they can remember where they've kept them. They might accuse other people within the home of taking their belongings, which is not the case. They might start putting things in the wrong cupboard, places that they used to know well. They go to the cupboard, they won't know what goes where, and they start putting things in the wrong places. They might start forgetting to turn off the tap, the oven, cooker. I know we all do that sometimes, but this will become more noticeable as the frequency tends to increase. Medication, that's a big one that I'm quite passionate about because as we get older, we are likely to be on more medication than younger folks. So, and those are very important medications in most cases. So we always ask family, if nothing else, check that your loved ones are taking their medication regularly because they tend to forget. So when they start forgetting, they might take too many or they might take too little. People might start forgetting to pay their bills. I've had patients whose telephone have been cut off because they've forgotten to pay their bills <coughs> or don't even realize they need to pay a telephone bill in the first place. People sometimes might start getting muddled with the time of the day. They might want to go to bed sometimes midday, sometimes early evening because they believe it's nighttime. And this is especially worse during the winter month when it becomes dark earlier. People might sometimes wake up in the middle of the night when the illness has progressed, getting ready to go to work, thinking it's morning, daytime instead of nighttime. They might start struggling with places they used to know well. Uh, initially, it might be maybe uh, cities that they've not been to for some time. They might start struggling if they ever go out to visit such places. And as the illness progresses, it might even be within their own home, especially waking up in the night, looking for the bathroom within the home or finding it difficult to get their way back to the bedroom. So that do happen sometimes. So we need to start looking at for symptoms in our elderly uh, loved ones. Uh, and don't put everything down to just aging. When these symptoms become 
frequent and persistent, I think it's time we seek help from our doctors. Another of the common symptoms is difficulty carrying out tasks that they used to do well. For example, things like cooking, using mobile phone, it might start with basic function. Maybe someone who used to be quite good sending text messages, doing stuff online, they start struggling with such uh, complicated tasks before uh, things like just making a basic call. So the more complex tasks is the one they start having difficulty with before the simpler tasks. They might struggle, especially when they become new appliances. For example, the old microwave packed up and you need to get a new one. That would be new setting, that would be new functions they need to learn. And sometimes they might under or overheat their food because they don't know how to use it properly. Often loved ones will have to write out the instruction by the appliances so that they know what to do. You might have washing machine, they might struggle with any new setting. So they just stick to one particular setting and that's what they use for everything. So appliances, the more complicated the appliances, the more they struggle with those ones. Then we have language. Language is another function of the brain that is often affected, especially in some form of dementia, the language is affected more than others. I know we all sometimes stop in the middle of a sentence when we are distracted and we can remember what we want to say, but this will become more often. Even the words, they will struggle to find out the, the use the right word. And they often will refer to uh, people or object as that thing, that person, because they can't remember the name or they can't remember the word they're looking for. And that's more common in a type of uh, dementia we call the frontal temporal lobe dementia, which affect primarily the language. Then another common symptom is recognition. And that can be quite challenging to family, especially as the illness progresses. People might not recognize objects they used to know. They might not recognize people they used to know well. Uh, initially would be people they've not seen for some time, but as the illness progresses, it might become even the grandchildren, the children and their spouses. Towards the end of the illness, some people every day the person they live with is a different person to them. And I had a patient who told me recently that despite being married to the husband for 50 years, every day is like she is a new person. And he recently asked her, tell me how you vote so that I will know your political uh, alliance and get to know you a bit better. That's the wife he's been married to for 50 years, but often they're not he does not recognize that. My see her as somebody important, somebody who is helping care for him, but she's not always the wife to him. Towards the end of the illness, they might not even recognize their own self. They might look at the mirror and can tell they are the one they are looking at. And we refer to that as the mirror sign. This usually tends to happen towards the very end of the illness. These symptoms I've discussed, the memory, the language, the recognition, and the ability to carry out daily tasks. Those are what we call the cognitive symptoms. They are the four main type of symptoms of group of symptoms that people with dementia will experience. There are other symptoms which are non-cognitive, doesn't have to do with the memory, the language, or the recognition. And those are things like depression that is common in some form of dementia because they start realizing early that they are losing their ability to remember. They are losing their ability to carry out some of the things they used to be able to do, and that start affecting their mood. People might start wandering out of their home at night time, not recognizing it as their home, or looking for their parents, or looking for their children. So that leads them 
put them at risk sometimes, especially when the weather is not good because they can go out at about 2 a.m. inappropriately dressed, not knowing the time and not knowing where they are. So we need to be very mindful of our loved ones to make sure that should they experience any of the symptoms of dementia that we get them help as soon as possible and put measures in place to safeguard them in their own home. There are many types of dementia, but we have a few that are quite common and we have the red type. The, the common ones are things like Alzheimer's dementia. I know a lot of people uh, have heard about Alzheimer's dementia. More than 50% of all type of dementia is due to Alzheimer's dementia. It is more common in women. It starts slowly and gradually progresses, and it is the memory, the short-term memory that is mainly affected. The second most common type of dementia is what we call vascular dementia, and that is more common in the Black community. It is commoner in people who have developed stroke in the past, in people who have high blood pressure, diabetes, and what we consider a cardiovascular risk factor. We have another type called the Parkinson's disease dementia or Lewy body dementia. They are all from one family and they tend to happen to people who have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease or a similar illness within that family. And memory is one of their main symptoms, but along with memory, they sometimes start seeing things that other people can see, and that can be quite distressing. And so they tend to seek help from the doctors early because of the strange symptoms they are experiencing. We have the frontotemporal dementia. In this group of people, the memory is not the major problem. The main problem is the change in personality and also language. So you might have some type of it that affects mainly the language and you might have another type that affects mainly the personality. So it will be a total change in the person's previous uh, personality before the dementia. They might become a bit more selfish. They might be eating more than usual, especially sweet food. They might also become more selfish and just thinking about themselves rather than other people. So a change in their total uh, behavior and personality. This type of dementia tends to happen to people below the age of 65, more than people above the age of 65. So it's more common in younger people. The other type of dementia, those are quite rare. So it's not, it's something that we don't see on a regular basis, but these four type of dementia are the most common type. And that's the one uh, who encounter more on a day-to-day -day practice. So why do people develop dementia? Like I mentioned earlier, age is the biggest reason. The older you get, the more your chances of developing dementia. So your chances of developing dementia increases with age. Being a woman is also another risk factor that if you're a woman, you're more likely to develop dementia than if you are a man, especially the Alzheimer's type. Another reason is that women tend to live a bit longer. So that increases their risk of developing dementia more than the men. Then we have a level of education. A good level of education tends to protect you against developing dementia. Genetics is another risk factor. It tends to run in some family more than others, especially for those with an early onset dementia. Those below the age of 65 years tend to run in family. Other 
factors will include things like hypertension, diabetes, physical inactivity, smoking, stroke. Those will refer to medically as cardiovascular risk factor, and they can increase your risk of developing both an Alzheimer's type of memory problem and also a vascular type of memory problem. Depression in middle life is another risk factor for developing dementia. So it's head injury, especially any serious head injury that can lead to, that would have led to a loss of consciousness. Those increases your risk with time of developing dementia. So what can we do to reduce this risk? I've mentioned them earlier, things like hypertension, inactivities, and depression in middle life, obesity, they can all increase the risk. We can do things and change our lifestyle to reduce this risk. One of them will include a diet and you start early, not later in life. You start early from an early age in middle life to make changes to your diet, to make sure that you're having a well-balanced diet that contains oily fish, which is rich in omega-3, contains nuts, appropriate fruit and vegetable. That will not only help reduce your risk of dementia, it will in reduce your risk of many other type of illness like diabetes, hypertension. So it's quite important, not just for the dementia but for your physical and mental health in general engage in activities that can help stimulate your brain and that could include things like going out for a walk keeping physically active playing board games doing word search quizzes keeping the brain active we normally use the term you either use it or you lose it so it is quite important. I know there are people who do crossword on a daily basis or do word search or play Scrabble or play other games on the internet. I think it's quite important. And I would encourage us to tell our loved ones to get involved in such activities. Blood pressure is another very important risk factor. If you have high blood pressure, your chances of diabetes and your chances of developing stroke, uh, dementia, those will all increase. So it's quite important that from midlife, you make sure that your blood pressure is properly maintained. I think they usually can have a regular check at their GP or people have means of checking their blood pressure regularly. And if you are hypertensive and your medication, make sure that you're taking your medication regularly and going to your GP to have your regular checkup to make sure that your blood pressure is well controlled. Diabetes is another risk factor. And diabetes, I think I'm not an expert in that field, but it can contribute to different type of illness. So it's quite important that if you're diabetic, make sure your blood sugar is well controlled or make sure you have your diet and other uh, diabetic uh, advice that you've been given. If make sure you adhere to them to make sure that you don't develop any of the complication associated with the illness and dementia is one of them because it is a risk factor for dementia. Find time to relax because the stress hormones kind of causes damage again to the brain cells. So we always say, find time to relax, find time to enjoy yourself at the end of the day because it is good for brain function. Also, try and keep active. Even if it's taking a short walk around your neighborhood, it's quite, it's quite beneficial, not just for your memory sake, but also for your blood pressure, for your weight, for your uh, diabetes. So I will encourage people to keep their loved ones active, to engage them, to ensure that they're doing regular physical activities even if it's just within the home.
some of the symptoms I've mentioned earlier. Um, like I said, we all experience them in different form, but when it becomes persistent, then we need to see the doctor. Early diagnosis is key. Early diagnosis does not only help with ensuring that you start treatment early, but it can also help with all the uh, entitlement that you might benefit from, things like attendance allowance, so that you can start putting things in place early. If you have any concern about your uh, memory, see your GP. He will carry out, he or she will carry out a short memory test to find out if, there, if it is a significant problem or is just normal aging. They will do some blood tests to just check that is no other type of illness that is making you forgetful. Because sometimes when people are short of blood, what we call anemia, they might have memory problem. Sometimes when people have a thyroid problem, they will have memory problem. So, and when they have infection, they might have memory problem. So the GP will just do a blood test to check that the memory problem is not as a result of those physical uh, health problems that can be corrected. Because if you're short of blood, what your GP will do, for example, if you're short of iron, is to make sure they treat you first and they check again to see if the memory problem was as a result of that or not. They might do a brain scan before they refer you to the specialist, or they might wait for the specialist to request for one. And if the GP think is a memory problem that needs further uh, evaluation, it will send it will send you to a memory clinic. Okay. Sometimes people do not seek help because they are worried that they will be put into a care home. They believe that there is no treatment for the illness or they are worried about the stigma, what other people would think. Those are some of the barriers that have prevented people from our community from seeking help. And that's why research has shown that we tend to get the diagnosis later compared to other community within the UK. There are medication that can help. It is not a cure. We do not have a cure at the moment for dementia, but we do have medication that can slow down the rate of progression. And one of those medic, three of those medications are from one group. And so we, the GP will make sure that your ECG is okay, and they will check you out to make sure you're okay to take medication from those three group. Then we have another group, uh, medication from another group, which can also help. It's called memantine. And that one is used for people who are at the moderate to severe stages of their illness. Then there's a new medication now, which is only licensed to be used in the United States. We still do not have the license in this country to use that medication. It's relatively new, so we don't know so much about the medication, but we are hoping that in time, it will be licensed in the UK for the treatment of dementia. Other than medication, medication is just one aspect of care. The other aspect is social support. When people with dementia, because of what we refer to as the care act, they are eligible to have a carer's assessment. So they we have an assessment for the person looking after them and also their care needs assessment will be done. And should they need any further support, social service will be able to provide them that support. People with diagnosis of dementia, they are eligible for what we call an attendance allowance. That is the one uh, allowance that I know that is not means tested. So it does not depend on how much you have in the bank. If you have 
a diagnosis of uh, dementia because you might have needs, even if the needs are being met by family member, they are still needs and you are eligible for attendance allowance. And that's something you could use or save towards any care need in future. They are befriending service depending on the area of the country where you live. There are home help, daycare, and respite care, even for people looking after uh, family with dementia. So those are social uh, support that are available and it is worth exploring. It might not be needed at the time of diagnosis, but at some stage during the illness, you might need it. So it's worth making sure that you are aware of that support and you have your assessment done should you need it in future. There are other things that can help people live in their own home longer. We call them assistive technology and we range from a dementia watch, dementia clock that might show the different times of the day that might tell you uh, the time of the day, the time to take your medication, the time to do other things within your own home. So it helps orient people to the time of the day. And that is quite important. That can keep them at home longer. There are some of this clock with the face of the sun during the daytime so that the, the patient realize it's daytime and some with the uh, face of a moon to tell you it's nighttime. So there are different variety of clocks out there that people can get that can help their loved one at home. Uh, then we have a pen that alarm, especially for those who live alone, who have a risk of fall. If you have those pendant alarm and you have a fall, you can easily assess help. We've had situation of people falling and not having any help for hours. So if you have people with dementia within your community, within your family, those are gadget that becomes handy. And I think it's not just for people with dementia, most elderly people with a risk of fall, a pain that alarm comes very handy. Hydration cups, those are other gadgets that can help. As people become forgetful, they sometimes can remember if they've had a drink or not, and dehydration can lead to some problem. So we have that hydration cup that can encourage them to drink. We have a medication dispenser, we call some carousel, who will tell you it's lunchtime, it's time for your medication. So it's kind of a reminder for people to take their medication. So if you live far from your loved ones, those are things you can put in place to ensure that they are safe in their own home. Other things we can do is called things like advanced planning for your future, lasting power of attorney. Uh, lasting power of attorney is a legal document that you can make when you still have the ability to choose who you want to look after your affairs. Should your illness progress to the stage that you are not able to make that decision? The law of the land in the UK only allows people to make decisions for anyone under the age of 18 years. Once you are above the age of 18 years, other people cannot make decisions for you, except you have legal documents such as lasting power of attorney where you've appointed somebody that I want this person to help look after my affair. I want this person to help make decisions regarding my health or my welfare. So if you have those in place, they will need to be registered at some point. And should you have ever get to a stage when you can make those decisions, then you've chosen somebody who can act in your best interest to make those decisions for you. Things like smoke alarm, uh, fire department can help check to make sure that smoke alarm is work, working properly in people's home so that if you forget to turn off your uh, cooker or you turn off your any other thing that might lead to uh, fire in the house that you can have the smoke alarm uh, raising that alert for you to get some form of help. So it's quite important that when you visit your loved one to make sure that their smoke alarm is 
working so that we need regular testing from family members. There are different charity organizations doing different things uh, for different community and there are some specific for uh, the black community, people with dementia within the black community and that's Cultural Dementia UK. We have the Alzheimer's Society which covers everyone with uh, dementia. That's not specific to any community, but there are different charity organization out there from Dementia UK to Carers UK that you can liaise with to get more information and uh, regarding support available within your community for people with dementia. Also, you can check with your local council uh, regarding uh, specific uh, things like uh, daycare and uh, activities within your local community, what is available. They are often advertised within their website, but you can get that information because things might vary across the country. Some community are better supported than others in terms of uh, facilities, because in some area, even within the catchment uh, area where I work, there are some community that have dementia trust fund, so they have more activities compared to other communities. So it's worth finding out what you have within your own local community. This brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, it's, it's quite a short one, and I'll be happy to answer questions regarding dementia or other mental illness. Uh, in the elderly. Thank you so much, at your, um, Mercy. As usual, a really, really interesting talk. Uh, I have a few questions in the in the chat um, because I think everybody's interested in a talk like that. Because if you're not there yet, needing the help, your help, you hopefully will be of an age that maybe uh, you know if you don't, if you're, if you have any problems, that like you'll know what to do. So one of, one of the questions I've been asked I've, that has come up is, um, why is it more common in black people? Okay, uh, from the research I've been carried out, uh, because the risk factor for developing it include things like high blood pressure and diabetes. And that, the, the, that is a big commoner in black people and also things like stroke. And that subsequently increases the risk of developing uh, dementia because it's a risk factor things like hypertension and diabetes which is common in our community they are risk factor for alzheimer's dementia and also vascular dementia okay now there's one, one thing i think it's universal but i know it's actually more common amongst black people one of the things that you talked about that i thought was really helpful was things like a financial package and i think if people don't um don't access help, they're doing themselves out of some of the support that you can get. Now, do you have to go to, to have those packages via your GP? Can you apply for them yourself in assessment for a loved one or yourself? You can. The, the Care Act in the UK actually stipulate that once you're diagnosed with dementia, you're eligible to have a care need assessment and carer's assessment. So that is your entitlement. So at the time of diagnosis, ideally you will be referred to social service. I know a lot of people are quite wary when they hear a referral to social service. Yes, definitely. But I tell them this is just for a care need assessment and the state is not going to fund it if they think you don't need it. So it's for a care need assessment. Even if you don't need it now, you might need it later but they will have you in their record as somebody with that diagnosis that might need it at some point. Okay. So you can do that. And things like attendance allowance, the number is out there. You can get attendance allowance and it's not means tested. We normally used to smile to say, that is the only allowance we know in the old, older people seem that does not depend on how much you have in your bank account. So that one is not means tested. Once you have that diagnosis, along with some other uh, disorder, you are eligible for an attendance allowance. 
Okay. Now, when you say attendance allowance, what, what does that mean? I think I might understand, but there might be people here that don't actually understand what an attendance allowance means okay, and what it gets you. Okay, that is the allowance that is paid to people with specific needs as a result of the illness they have. For example, somebody with dementia might be forgetting to take their tablet. They might need their loved ones calling them in the morning or in the afternoon to take their tablet. So that is a need, even if it's a met need, even if somebody is calling them, reminding them to take and they can't take it, even if it's a uh, a met need is still a need. And th that allowance is to help support that because if your family is not doing that for you, you will be paying somebody to do that. So it's an allowance that is paid to you to help meet some of your needs that are risen because of the disorder. That's, that's really important take home message for people that are here today. Um, I've got a number of questions. I've got about three questions about, let's say, they're all, they're questions from different people who are relatively young, I will say, who are late 40s, early 50s. I think young is relative. So, and they're saying that I forget things easily. Um, even some part of my childhood history is off. So the, I've got three questions. The oldest person who's asked this question has put their age as 52. Somebody is 49. And the other person hasn't mentioned their age. Said, so does this mean that I have dementia? Not necessarily. And that's why I say we're all forgetful. We all, we all laugh sometimes that we're all forgetful. And I tell the students usually when they come around, that if we don't forget, you'll be expecting all the students to score 100% all the time. To so some, some degree, we're all forgetful. But it's when that increases, when the frequency of that forgetfulness, if it's a deviation from what it used to be, then it is what's seeing your GP. That's what I always say. If you're worried about it, get it checked out. Okay. Um, another thing that has, has, is a worry that some people don't access help because of the worry about being put in a care home. I think that's a universal concern and worry because yeah. care homes have quite a bad name. I know that there are many care homes that are of high quality, but the ones that you hear about in the press and on the TV is always the ones where they've treated people badly. And, you know, it's a running joke amongst people my age saying that, I hope my children don't put me into a care home, you know, but there's some places I'm sure that are, are okay. What's the, is, is there any reassurance that you can provide that having this diagnosis does not mean that you will absolutely go into a care home? What's the relationship with dementia and care homes? Well, like I said, dementia is, is a journey, is a disorder that is quite a short journey and a long one, depending on the person's age and other risk factor. But we try to reassure people, even when they come for assessment, that is one of the worry they don't even come for the assessment in the first place, that they are going to be put into a care home. And we say to people, having the diagnosis does not equate to a care home. The government's aim and the aim of the team is to keep you in your own home. That is a cheaper option for the government, is to keep you in your own home for as long as possible. And that's why we talk about those assistive technology that help people in their own home. And even having carers at some point come to people's home is when those care needs, is when it becomes so unsafe for people to be in their own home, even when they are supported by carers, sometimes up to four times a day coming in, that's when we consider it. And that is the last option. We always say it's not a cheap option. So the government is not putting you in the care home because they can't be paying for that for those who can afford to, but it's not a cheap option. We do not, we don't make those decisions lightly and it's not a decision for us to make except in extreme cases. But people having the diagnosis, people live and die in their own home with dementia. We encourage people to live well with dementia. Having the diagnosis is not a life sentence. People do live well with dementia. Is knowing that I have these difficulties and putting measures in place, both by yourself and your family, to support you in your own home. Thank you for that. I think that was really clear. So that the fear of that shouldn't stop you from going to see your GP and seek help. There's a question here that I'm hoping you're going to say a big fat no. And it says, can dementia be connected to the menopause? Not that I'm aware of. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Not that I'm aware of at all. <laughs>
Um, someone has said that you've used the phrase quite commonly um, at, the, at the end of dementia, is someone suffering from dementia? You said you frequently use the phrase end of dementia in somebody suffering dementia. Can you explain more? Uh, the, when you say end, like I always say, is a journey, and uh, oh, it it is a journey for some people longer than others because uh, we normally say when people come and ask how long does this person have, and from research is from three to twenty years. So if you are eighty at the time of diagnosis, that could mean hundred years. That could mean eighty three years. So it's a very wide. Uh, spectrum is not dementia on its own is not the we won't say that's what towards the end of life is the cause of death it will be other things associated as a result maybe somebody developed pneumonia or have other symptoms but dementia is not it's not like cancer to say this is what killed this person it's just an illness that people have and as the illness progresses people if they are not looked after, might not feed properly. So they might have complication as a result of that. They might not look after themselves properly and might have complication as a result of that. But on his own, the diagnosis on his own is not what is responsible for anyone's death, but the complication associated with it. Okay. I don't know if that answered the question or if I didn't I get think it. Does, uh, if, you, if it hasn't, just clarify that I think it has answered the question the person's put thank you in the chat box. Okay. Um, the other thing that someone's asked is about, um, and I'm just going to read it as they've, as they've sent me the message, is the connection between dementia, if any, and um, witchcraft. Oh. It's a question oh. that somebody has put. Well, I, I think I remember when we gave the talk uh, five months ago, uh, my co-presenter then who as a charity uh, looking after people with dementia in Nigeria did say that she, she'd asked people this question several times, what is wrong with this person? Or probably as have a memory problem and they will say there's witchcraft. There is no study out there that I know that has linked dementia with witchcraft. And I think when people don't know the cause of an illness, when they don't have anything to link that illness with, it's very easy within that community to point it out to witchcraft or other powers that might be. But dementia happen across all community, Asian, white, black, it is universal. And the reason why people get it is old age. In the black community, especially in African Caribbean uh, uh, community, because the life expectancy is not as high as what you will have in the Western world. People are not old enough at that time to develop the illness because it's an illness for the elderly. But now that those community is aging, you're beginning to find out more. And when we look back, some of those people that they are referred to as witches are people who are probably forgetful. I remember growing up when they often say, oh, the relatives, they've become children again because they can remember. And in extreme cases, people can remember their earlier life, but they can remember what happened yesterday. They can remember their childhood. They might start calling their children by the names of their siblings because that's what they can remember. They remember going to school. They start looking for their parents or they start looking for their children. It depends on what stage in their life that they are living in at that time. But there is no association that I'm aware of medically or otherwise that link dementia to witchcraft. It's an illness that resulted from getting older. So now that we're having 80 something, 90 something year old in a community, your chances of developing dementia at the age of 80 is over 80, 30%. So if you go around assessing everybody over the age of 80, over 30% of them will meet the diagnosis of dementia. And so the important thing is how to support, that's why we're giving talks like this and how to manage it and not to try and demonize it. Because I think what happens is that anything that people don't understand and they're worried with, especially when you see maybe regression, um, people are concerned about it. 
and would give it alternative names if they cannot yeah. come up with a reasonable explanation. Would that be fair to say? Yes, definitely. And and there's it. And I know, like, not just the psych, uh, the the stigma that comes with dementia in the U in the UK, the diagnosis and the assessment is done mainly by the psychiatric service, which comes with its own stigma. That when you tell people that sometimes I'm about to go to the elderly patient, and when I want to introduce myself, just to allow them. To, just to make sure that they allow me to carry out the assessment, I will say, I'm a memory doctor. Because as soon as you said, I'm from psychiatry, they'll say, I'm not mad, why am I seeing you? So it's people's understanding of your role and what you do. And so you can imagine that back in our own community in African Caribbean, if it's not the neurologist, then it's even going to be more difficult because there is a stigma associated with that specialty to say, why am I seeing somebody from this specialty? I don't have that kind of problem. Okay, so how did it evolve to being looked after by psychiatrists? Because really, why is it not neurologists? Well, that's what so we normally we say we share, share the, a checkered pass with neurology and there is a big overlap. In some countries, they're seen mainly by neurologists, but in this country, they are seen mainly by psychiatrists. So it's the same kind of domain that we cover a lot of things, not just with the behavior, but also with the, uh, the behavior aspect of mental disorder come solely on the psychiatry, but the organic aspect, which is mainly all oh, the psychiatry, things like dementia, comes under us in this country. In some countries like Israel, there will be neurologists. In, in America, will be both the neurologists and the psychiatry, so it varies. But in UK, primarily is under the domain of psychiatry. Is a, in, in, according to the diagnostic criteria, the ICD-10, the International Classification of Disorder, it comes under psychiatry. Okay, okay, yeah. One of the things you also mentioned, which was new to me, was about medication. Yeah. So what does the medication do? Because my understanding is that, you know, the brain's not one of these things that you can easily reverse things. So what, what's the role of medication in this, in this illness? The, the medication slows it down. Like with dementia, there are some chemicals in the brain that are affected, which one of them is a big medical word, is a, is a uh, acetylcholine, is one of the uh, chemicals who help send message between the brain cells is affected, is reduced. So these medication are medication that help boost that level uh, of a, um, Acetylcholine, so we call three of them the cholinesterase inhibitors. So those are the first three ones for mild to moderate form of the medication or, or mild to moderate form of the disease. So what they do, they help increase that level and also help improve the, the memory and also the level of functioning. So we say it's not a cure, but it just takes the speed of the car from 30 miles per hour to 20 miles per hour. So it helps slow down the rate at which you're deteriorating. Okay, that's, um, that was new to me. And I suppose it's something that um, your GP or psychiatrist will determine whether you need. Yes, uh, usually like in my area where I work, when we do carry out the assessment, we have what we call the shared protocol with the GP that for the first two months, we give the medication from secondary care. We monitor for any side effect. And after two months, we transfer that to the care of the GP. That is in the Norfolk and Suffolk area. So I don't know of other areas in the UK. Okay. You know, as a, as a consequence of getting ill, some things will, will happen inevitably, isn't it? Yeah. So would you say that if I happen to live to 100, which I'm hoping to, <laughs> It runs in the family. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. uh, what are my chances? Does it mean that all of us that get to about 100 will have some form of dementia or is it? Is, 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 this that, is no, not inevitable, is it? No, it's not inevitable. And that's why we say that reducing the risk from midlife is really helpful. Taking care of yourself and doing the right things from midlife is helpful. Uh, age is the biggest risk factor. And I, like I said, 30% 40% by the time you get into 90, we have it. So, but that is a huge 60% without the diagnosis. So it's not inevitable. Okay. 
So the, there are lots of things that you talked about to protect you. So that's the thing that is, is where we need to focus on here. Yes. Um, well, some of the take home messages I want people to take home about from this is that it's one, it's not inevitable. Two, there are things that you can do to help yourself, to protect yourself. Um, just as we've talked about all these um, illnesses, one of the things I'm really keen about in, in these our sessions is not just to give people advice about how, how to manage chronic illness, but all the preventative measures that you can take now that you're in your 40s, 50s, take charge of your own health to try and put yourself in a better stead for the future. And, and that would be something that you'd advocate as an old age psychiatrist. Definitely, definitely. And that's why we, we emphasize on uh, midlife, things like midlife depression need to be treated, uh, blood pressure, and you take care of those things at an earlier age so that you are in a better position as you're getting older. So keeping active, we can overemphasize that, that you need to keep active is quite beneficial in many ways. You need to keep active. You need to make sure your blood pressure is well controlled. You need to make sure that if you are diabetic, that is well controlled. And that is helpful, not just for the memory. The chances of getting stroke is higher in our community. So those are things. You're taking care of the basic, but that basics take care of a lot of other things. So it's quite important that we pay attention to the things that are important in midlife. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mercy. Oh, there's another question here about, um, can dementia be connected to dyslexia? Uh, not that I'm aware of at the moment. I'm not the, the I, I don't, I'm not custodian for everything uh, okay. related to dementia in terms of knowledge, but not that I'm aware of. I've got a good knowledge in terms of dementia. That's my day-to-day -day job, but I don't, there is no relationship between dyslexia on its own and dementia. But what I do know is that your level of education increases your risk of having dementia. They did some studies many years ago with nuns in Covent, and that's why they found that, that those with a good level of education, their risk of developing dementia is lower than those without a good level of education. So if the dyslexia stop the person from learning or attaining any significant uh, educational uh, attainment, then that might, in a roundabout way, increase their risk of developing dementia. You know, I'm a great fan of all these um, apps that say uh, mind games. Um, do, do they help when they say you're training your mind are they, are they, is that just a fad? Am I just wasting my money or is it going to keep me away from dementia? Yeah, well, like we said, it's helping reduce the risk. It's not, it, it doesn't eliminate it. But just like any game, uh, that I always advise people, we call them cognitive activities, activities that have stimulate the brain, jigsaw puzzles, crossword, card game, any game, those so are all quite helpful in reducing your risk of developing dementia. Okay, that's great. So I, I keep yeah, up with so you're not wasting. You need those app. I do have an app about uh, have a what search app or crossword search app, yeah. which I do every day, and okay. that just open that help reduce my risk as I grow older. Well, we heard it from the expert. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mercy, for such uh, entertaining and um, a great session. That's really, really interesting. Um, for those of you who have asked whether it's recorded. All our sessions are available on um, YouTube for you to go and access at a, um, a, in your own time. So they, are, they will be there for you to have a look at as well. So I'd just like to say thank you so much to Mercy. Um, I know you're in the um, beautiful city of Durham today and you have joined us from there. So I'm, I'm really grateful that you contributed to our session. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you. Okay, see you all next week. Uh, nice Thank to see you. you. And I hope you're all enjoying all the sessions and all the activities that the Caribbean African Health Network have put on for Black History Month. Um, so thank you. Um, Elizabeth, anything to add? Hi there, Dr. Ngozi. Thank you so much. 
Um, so I'm just trying to spot that. Thank you so much and um, for that lovely session, Dr. Mercy, as well. Um, I believe we've all been um, blessed and learned some new facts about dementia um, and can go away at leaving today's session encouraging and teaching others within the community. Um, yes, for those that have asked the question of, is this session recorded? You can always watch the, uh, all of our Health Hour and Healthy Heart sessions either on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page, which I've posted the links in the chat box, just so that you can watch and still keep learning, encouraging others as well. So you can share that with your family, colleagues and friends also. Um, I just want to encourage those as well. Um, our Healthy Hats, Healthy Hearts is back again on Tuesday and we've started, last week was our launch for our tailored support sessions and um, we are doing a health challenge. So please do tune in. Um, ultimately, we're setting our goals, um, you know, our health goals, our diet goals, sorry, um, and working together, you know, as a group to make those right decisions when it comes to our diets. So we have Dr. Hibba and Dr. Alice. Um, and those are our tailored support sessions. We just come on Zoom, learn together, um, and followed by a 30-minute exercise session um, by our physical instructor, Orlando. So if you're interested in that and available at that time, we do encourage. We are still taking people on for these tailored support sessions. So that will be running for, I believe, 24 weeks. Um, I, I think that's the, yeah. I'd have to double check that, but ultimately, you know, it would be good to get everyone on that. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in that, you can just email us at events at Khan um, or drop a message to either one of my colleagues and we can get you registered onto that. Um, you know, it is still Black History Month, so we're encouraging people um, to go to different Black History Month events that are held on during this month. Um, and just to be in the physical space, interact with people as we celebrate Black History Month. Um, but that's all for now. Um, if anyone does have any questions or, you know, you know, want to follow us, do follow us on our social media platforms as well. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all at our future events. Over to you, Dr Ngozi. Thank you and see you next week. Okay, bye. Bye. Well done, darling. Thank you. Well, I'll see you for breaking my back. Bye. <laughs>